Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is July 11, 1981, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 66. A few days ago, on June 29, 1981, the Supreme Court ruled in effect that the United States is now in a state of war. That is the real meaning of the Court's 7-2 decision in the case of former CIA agent Philip Agee. The Court declared that the government can revoke the passport of a person who discloses secrets about American spying overseas. The decision was bottomed on the government's right to restrict public speech or press stories about the movement of American troops or sailing dates of American ships. My friends, this governmental power to restrict free speech has always applied only during wartime. So a state of war has now been officially recognized, not by our sleeping Congress, but by the Supreme Court of the United States. And what kind of war is it? It's a secret war, my friends. The AG decision hands important new powers to the United States Government to help in closing down America for the nuclear holocaust to come. By the time this secret war erupts into the open, America will already be on a complete war footing. The secret war, which has just been quietly acknowledged by the Supreme Court, has been raging now for five years. It began in the summer of 1976 with a crisis which to this day has never yet been made public officially, the underwater missile crisis. Since then the secret war has expanded into pre-war nuclear sabotage of the United States secret space warfare, and intelligence warfare involving techniques which sound unbelievable to many people. Many skirmishes in the secret war have been kept out of the news. Others have been impossible to hide completely, so instead they have been explained away in various ways by government spokesmen and the kept media. But these things, my friends, are becoming harder and harder to hide because we are inching closer and closer to the brink of all-out war, and as we do so the incidents are becoming more frequent, more violent, and causing more casualties. In my AUDIO LETTER REPORTS to you over the years I have detailed many of these developments as they have happened. I believe you have a right to know because it's your life and your country that is at stake. For that reason I must now reveal the greatest tragedy yet in the secret war. My friends, the greatest naval disaster since World War II has now befallen the United States. As yet there is no hint of this disaster in the news. Part of the reason is that the Pentagon is not yet totally sure what happened. In addition, a frantic effort is underway to construct a believable cover story which will save the Pentagon officials from mass dismissals and disgrace. Their secret war games cause the disaster. Whenever the cover story is decided upon and released, the plan is to pretend that the disaster has freshly happened at that time. That will be a lie. The final act in this twin naval catastrophe took place, ironically, on American Independence Day, July 4, 1981. Not one but two United States naval vessels have been destroyed in the secret catastrophe. I will not give the names of these naval vessels right now out of respect for the next of kin of their crews. It's only right to let the next of kin be notified before the names of the vessels are made public. For the same reason I will not divulge the types of vessels involved at this time, but I can tell you that two different types of naval combatants were involved in the double tragedy. The remains of the two American naval vessels are resting on the bottom of the Norwegian Sea between Iceland and Norway. The navigational coordinates of the larger ship are 68 degrees 56 minutes 24 seconds north, 1 degree 6 minutes 40 seconds east. The smaller vessel is to the east of that in two pieces, 
one piece about 30 miles away, the other some 40 miles beyond that. My friends, I cannot say how long the Pentagon will keep quiet about this tragedy. One thing is for sure, though, they will keep quiet for as long as they can. Only a few months ago on April 9, an American submarine sank a Japanese tanker, supposedly by ramming it. And what did the United States Government do? The submarine departed without any effort to save the survivors as the ship sank. Then the United States Government did not even report the incident to Japan for a day and a half. It was only because the Japanese knew themselves about the sinking that the United States admitted it. Even then the Navy issued a report about the incident that is full of holes. But this time, my friends, both vessels which have been sunk are United States vessels, so there is no telling how long the silence will last. We are now on a timetable for Nuclear War I that is aiming for mid-1982, about one year from now. Whether that timetable will be speeded up or slowed down by events I cannot predict, but I will continue for as long as I can to let you know what you need to know in order to understand our headlong rush toward war. My three special topics this month are Topic No. 1, the Israeli Practice Raid for Nuclear Armageddon. Topic No. 2, America's Launch on Warning Plan for Nuclear Suicide. And Topic No. 3, What You Can Do During America's Final Days. Topic No. 1. To the north and west of the Persian Gulf there lies a land whose ancient origins are lost in the mists of time. It's the land between the rivers Tigris and Euphrates, the cradle of civilization. Tradition has it that the Garden of Eden was in this area, and in fact the Book of Genesis even mentions the Euphrates as one of its boundaries. Later we're told that the Tower of Babel was located in the same area spawning the ancient historical city of Babylon. Elsewhere in that same area the famous city of Nineveh also rose and flourished, becoming the center of the Assyrian Empire. All those things took place long before the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, but centuries after His coming the glory of the land between the rivers rose again. Those were the days of the Muslim Saracen Empire of the Caliphs. By around 800 A.D. the empire of Caliph Harun el Rashid was huge. It encompassed all of Arabia, Persia, Egypt, Syria, North Africa, and parts of what is now southern Russia. The home of the Saracen Empire was that same rich land between the Tigris and Euphrates, and the jewel at its very center was a magnificent city. The capital city of the ancient Caliphs was built from scratch for that purpose starting in 762 A.D., and what a city it was! By all accounts the court of the Caliphs was the most magnificent the world has ever seen. The palace was so huge that more than 80,000 servants lived and worked within it. Gold, silver, and precious stones were turned into ornaments of unparalleled beauty by craftsmen educated in the highly advanced science of the day. In the Hall of Audience there stood a famous tree of gold, and on the branches of the tree, says tradition, there were perched birds of gold and silver studded with precious stones. The birds were music boxes, and they fluttered their mechanical wings as they poured forth intricate songs. Outside the palace the city was arranged in expanding circles with a system of three walls at the outer boundary. The city quickly became a world center of commerce, science, literature, and art. The city, my friends, was ancient Baghdad, the city of the Thousand and One Arabian Nights. The splendor of old Baghdad made it a tempting prize for other less civilized peoples who heard of it. It was not long before ancient Baghdad became a focal point of warfare involving especially the Mongols and Turks. Rapacious greed destroyed much of the beauty which had once been the hallmark of Baghdad. Constant warfare took its toll, and over the centuries the Saracen Empire decayed in culture and power. The ancient irrigation systems were destroyed, 
and what was once a Garden of Eden began to turn into a wasteland. In 1516 Baghdad fell permanently to the Turks, and the once magnificent Saracen Empire faded into the sands of a man-made desert. The Baghdad of today is a far cry from that fabled city of old. Modern Baghdad, Iraq, lies on the east bank of the Tigris, across the river from the ruins of the ancient city. Even so, the Baghdad of today does have certain things in common with the Baghdad of old. Modern Baghdad is struggling once again to become a city of science, culture, and power. And like the ancient city, modern Baghdad is faced with a powerful enemy who wants to destroy it. Last month on Sunday, June 7, an aerial strike force of 14 warplanes started their jet engines in the country that calls itself Israel. Eight of them were American F-16s loaded with one-ton bombs. The other six were American F-15s, air superiority fighters to fly along and protect the F-16s from any possible defenders. After the planes took off, they refueled from an aerial tanker for the long war flight they were about to make. For days beforehand the Israeli planes had been flying training exercises designed to look like the early part of the real raid. As a result, when the war raid was launched on that Sunday last month, it looked at first like just another drill. To maintain the surprise, the Israeli strike force thundered eastward over Jordan at high altitude, mimicking Jordanian Air Force procedures. Next the Israeli fighter bombers raced into and across northwest Saudi Arabia. Following secret orders from the Pentagon, the American manned AWACS radar plane patrolling over Saudi Arabia did not report the Israeli intrusion into Saudi airspace. Thanks to this pre-planned cooperation by the United States, the fate of the Israeli target in Baghdad was sealed. The Israeli F-15s and 16s streaked across the Syrian desert of Iraq on the deck below Iraqi radar. As they neared Baghdad, they appeared to rise from nowhere out of the Iraqi countryside as they climbed to begin the attack. At 6.30 p.m. Baghdad time, a hail of one-ton bombs began raining down on the Iraqi nuclear reactor which was under construction. Within a matter of minutes the reactor facility lay in smoking ruins. The Israeli bombing raid into Iraq was a momentous event, the kind of thing we expect to hear about immediately through our electronic news media. Instead the world remained ignorant of the raid for another full day. Iraq imposed a news blackout about it at first for military reasons. The raid had come without warning or provocation and the Iraqis were not sure what else Israel might be about to do. The United States Government knew about the raid beforehand, but true to form these days, the United States said nothing to the world about what it knew. It was left to Israel itself to publicly announce the raid, which it did in triumphant, glowing terms. Around the world the reaction was revulsion, shock, and condemnation, and no wonder. For one thing, Israel is trying to justify its acts of war in arrogantly self-righteous terms. Israel complains that Iraq was building a reactor but wants everyone to forget her own nuclear capability which is already operational. Israel has always refused to sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty which Iraq has signed. The Iraqi nuclear facility has been inspected regularly by the International Atomic Energy Agency during its construction phase when any violations would be hard to hide, but Israel, which has never once submitted to international inspection, bombed the plant anyway. Beyond these matters of international law and simple justice, Israel has also opened Pandora's box in more ways than one. For one thing, Israel has broken an unwritten taboo against attacks of any kind against nuclear facilities. Now. The nuclear power plants of the world have been made fair game. Military, paramilitary, or terrorist attacks on nuclear power plants will no longer be unthinkable thanks to the Israeli raid into Iraq. And my friends, this includes the 72 nuclear power plants now operating right here in the United States. By secretly going along with the Israeli raid, 
The United States Pentagon is sowing the seeds of nuclear terrorism in our own land. Most important of all, the Israeli raid on Iraq's nuclear plant was a dry run for a far more important raid. I'm referring to the coming Israeli limited nuclear attack on Saudi Arabia's oil fields. The nuclear destruction of Saudi Arabia's oil fields is far from a new idea, as my older listeners already know. I first reported that this was in the works nearly six years ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 6. At that time the plan revolved around the so-called Sinai Accord involving Egypt, Israel, and the United States. Two hundred or so Americans were in the Sinai under that agreement, and they were intended to become the focus of an incident to set off war in the area. The actual attack on Saudi oil fields was to be carried out using Cobra helicopter gunships with special air-to-ground atomic missiles. As I detailed at the time, the plan was part of the ongoing joint plan between the long-time rulers of the United States and the Soviet Union for world domination. As originally conceived, the plan called for a nuclear capping of Saudi oil fields sometime in 1976. It was not carried out at that time because the secret alliance between the United States and Russia started coming apart in 1976. The old Rockefeller allies in Russia, the Bolsheviks, were being quietly overthrown there. In their place a new ruling group were taken over. Russia's new rulers hate the Bolsheviks and have been expelling them from Russia in great numbers, and because America's then secret rulers, the Rockefellers, had supported Bolshevik rule in Russia from 1917, Russia's new rulers were taking defensive actions. The result was the still-secret underwater missile crisis which I reported in the summer of 1976. The collapse of the Rockefeller Soviet Alliance during 1976 and 1977 brought a reprieve for Saudi Arabia. Now America's Bolshevik Government has carried over the plan to destroy Saudi oil fields. The plan has been continuously updated and revised for maximum strategic value in the new international situation. I've given reports periodically in my AUDIO LETTERS about the evolving status of this war plan. For three years now the secret plan for Saudi Arabia's nuclear doom has been integrated into a new master strategy for a nuclear war. Behind closed doors America's Bolshevik military planners have secretly shifted to a first-strike nuclear strategy against Russia. When the Saudi oil fields are capped off in the Israeli nuclear raid, it is intended to set in motion a chain of events. Those events are to culminate in Nuclear War I, with America striking first at Russia. I first reported the broad outlines of this radical new war plan in AUDIO LETTER No. 37 for August 1978. I reported that the first step was to be a supposedly surprise agreement between Israel and Egypt the following month at Camp David. The Camp David hoax went off without a hitch, and the following spring the Egyptian-Israeli Treaty was signed in Washington. It was called a Peace Treaty, but its real purpose was to set the stage for war. My friends, the so-called Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty is just a new, more elaborate version of the Sinai Accord of six years ago. The Sinai Accord was held together by American technicians in the Sinai. Likewise, now the Egyptian-Israeli Treaty is leading toward a primarily American military force in the Sinai Peninsula due to start April 1982. Now as then, the purpose is to provide a pretext to drag the United States directly into a Middle East war. From there the conflict is to spread into all-out war. In order to carry out the coming limited nuclear attack on Saudi Arabia, world opinion must be prepared in advance as much as possible. The idea of actually using nuclear weapons must be made less unthinkable to us, and Israel must be provided some excuse for calling Saudi Arabia a deadly threat. In both of these areas rapid progress is now being made. To make an atomic raid more thinkable when it takes place, Israel has been using the old technique of gradualism. 
For years Israeli warplanes have been striking into Lebanon. For a while there were feeble protests from Washington for public consumption that Israel might be misusing her American weapons. Israel replied that she was attacking a vital threat, the PLO, and just kept it up. After a while the novelty wore off and most of us began to just accept it. Next the Israelis raised the threshold of psychological pain a notch higher. In clear and direct violation of agreements with the Pentagon, Israeli aircraft started dropping cluster bombs on Lebanon. Lebanese villagers, men, women, and children were maimed, dismembered, and killed. When we first heard about it, it sounded inexcusable to many, but after a short while we forgot about our outrage and went on to other things. Once again the United States Government was careful to do nothing. We had learned to accept something a little worse than before in warfare. Step by step the Israeli violations of international law and of agreements with the United States have become bolder and bolder. Each time the United States Government has given lip service to law, morality, and the momentary concern of the American public, but each time Israel has been given the green light again with hardly a pause. It was only a matter of weeks ago that the Israeli Air Force shot down two Syrian helicopters over Lebanon using American-made aircraft. The result was a new crisis over Syrian anti-aircraft missiles. With that crisis still unresolved, Israel has now destroyed a nuclear reactor in Iraq, and all the while the United States Government continues to let Israel have its own way, because, my friends, Israel is doing exactly what the Bolshevik military planners here want done. Having accepted Israel's destruction of a nuclear reactor, it's only a short step beyond to accept the use of battlefield nuclear weapons. That still leaves the matter of setting up Saudi Arabia as a credible threat to Israel. The United States is taking care of that problem while pretending to do the Saudis a favor. Early next year Saudi Arabia is to start taking delivery of a fleet of F-15 fighters equivalent in many ways to those of Israel. On top of that, the sale of five AWACS radar surveillance planes to Saudi Arabia is being considered. The secret purpose of these arms deals with Saudi Arabia is the exact opposite of what is claimed. The United States claims that it wants to improve Saudi Arabia's national security, presumably against Russia. But my friends, the real purpose is to give Israel the excuse it needs for a preemptive attack on Saudi Arabia. The model for Israel's attack to come against Saudi Arabia was the attack last month against Iraq. Israel claimed that the Iraqi reactor was going to be used someday against Israel. On that basis Israel described its preemptive surprise attack on Iraq as a defensive action. It was even said that Israel had saved lives by carrying out the surgical attack before the facility was completed. Much the same things will be said and done when the time comes for Israel to attack the Saudi oil fields. The Israelis will act more and more frightened that a Saudi Arabia armed with modern F-15s will someday use them against Israel. As proof, they will quote out of context past Saudi calls for a Muslim Shihad to gain control of Jerusalem. And to justify the preemptive nature of the raid, the Israelis will insist that they were forced to strike before or shortly after delivery of the AWACS radar planes. As in the case of the Iraqi nuclear plant, Israel will characterize the Saudi raid as having been designed to spare as many lives as possible. The raid will not strike at heavy population centers, but at the oil fields. In this way the Israelis will say that they have eliminated the financial basis of the alleged threat to Israel. My friends, when I first began reporting on the plan to cap off Saudi Arabia's oil wells in an Israeli nuclear raid, Many people found it unthinkable. That was five and six years ago. Something called detente was still the official line. 
nuclear war between the United States and Russia sounded too far-fetched at that time for most people to even pay attention. And as for Israel bombing Saudi oil fields, even the Saudis themselves could not believe it when they were informed of the plan. How quickly times change! People no longer scoff at the idea that nuclear war is approaching between Russia and America, and now even the Israeli plan to bomb the Saudi oil fields is finally beginning to surface. Last month on June 12, only five days after the Israeli raid into Iraq, the New York Daily News carried an article about Israel's oil weapon. Quote, unquote. The article begins, Israel has an oil weapon too, one just as powerful as the threat of an embargo by Saudi Arabia or any other Arab state. Israel can bomb the wells. Further on, an aide to Israeli Prime Minister Begin is quoted as saying, The Saudis can cut off oil to the West, and so can we. Unquote. When Israel decides to bomb the Saudi wells, it will do so in the same way as it bombed the Iraqi nuclear plant. Israel will use its newest and best American jet fighter bombers against Saudi Arabia, just as it did against Iraq. The raid will be launched with absolutely no advance warning, just as was done against Iraq. And just as happened to Iraq, the Israelis will make maximum use of deception in the raid itself. For some two years now, the Israeli Air Force has been carrying out mock air raids on northwestern Saudi Arabia. Every so often Israeli F-15 fighter bombers swoop in unexpectedly across the Saudi border from the Gulf of Aqaba. As often as not, they carry out a simulated attack on the Saudi air base at Tabuk. The frustrated Saudis are falling into a trap by reacting exactly as expected. They are crying out for their own F-15s so that Israel will be unable to continue these brazen overflights. What the Saudis have so far refused to accept is that this is all a ruse, a deceptive trick. One day in 1982, perhaps sooner, Israel plans to launch the real raid. At first it will look like just another of those mock attacks on the Saudi air base. But when the Israeli jets pass over the base, they will not turn back as in the past. Instead they will thunder overhead in a straight line toward the Persian Gulf. Disappearing into the undefended interior of Saudi Arabia, they will disperse to elude further detection. As in the case of last month's raid into Iraq, the American manned AWACS plane will conveniently fail to locate the Israeli attackers in time. Within two hours nuclear fireballs will cap off the Saudi oil wells. The world will be in a state of shock. The industrial heart of Europe and Japan will be crippled, but this will be only the beginning. Bolshevik America will finally be able to put its gasoline rationing plan into operation. The country will be put on a wartime basis. Our youth will be drafted and our country will be made to accept this first open act of nuclear warfare since World War II. Israel has paved the way for all this with its destruction of the Iraqi nuclear reactor. With its attack on the ancient Garden of Eden, Israel has begun leading the world into the valley of the shadow of death. Topic No. 2 during the past several months I've been trying to call attention to a major new trend in current world events. The world is splintering, splitting up into factions which are all squabbling with one another. The whole world is becoming like the Balkans before World War I, a cauldron of crises, seething and bubbling hotter and hotter. We are beginning to see not just one crisis at a time but several crises all at once. In AUDIO LETTER No. 63 I gave a warning to watch for this trend to speed up. Our world is being divided and balkanized deliberately by the Bolsheviks who now control the United States Government. In 1914 World War I erupted suddenly, seemingly by accident, out of the unstable ferment of crises in the Balkans. Likewise. 
Nuclear War I is intended to erupt soon out of the spreading chaos of worldwide crises. My friends, World War I was not accidental. It was only made to appear that way. Likewise, Nuclear War I will not be accidental, but we are being conditioned to think it is accidental when it happens. Most Americans today, when we think about global war, think about World War II, not World War I. We tend to think about the repeated appeasement of Hitler during the 30s by Britain and France, and we recall that it all ended in the most destructive war in history, World War II. The so-called Reagan Administration has taken advantage of these costly historical memories by saying in effect, no more appeasement. Hearing that, millions of Americans cheer in agreement. Meanwhile, under the guise of non-appeasement, the United States is actually pursuing a policy of confrontation. We are told with a Hollywood smile that we must act tough to keep the peace. Then we go beyond that, acting not just tough but belligerent in ways designed to move us toward war. Long ago President Teddy Roosevelt said, Walk softly, but carry a big stick. Instead, the alleged Reagan Administration is swaggering like a bully with nothing but a chip on its shoulder. The Reagan-style government rhetoric is slanted toward our memories of World War II. As a result, most Americans are prevented from thinking about the more important lessons of World War I. But the balkanization of our world today is not lost on everyone. There are beginning to be worried establishment voices talking about it. An example was a recent article in that old establishment publication, Foreign Affairs. In this article the author expressed worry over the United States' attitude these days of not even talking to the Russians. It says this leaves us, quote, in a situation where the risk of war is higher because of the danger of miscalculation by each side. You could stumble into war, almost like 1914. The Reagan Administration model is Munich. I think that's wrong. The correct model is 1914." Unquote. My friends, that's exactly what I reported several months ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 63, except for one thing. The environment for miscalculation is not accidental, but deliberate. It's an old Bolshevik axiom that in chaos there's opportunity. Others too are breaking with past behavior to express unprecedented concern. For example, Harvard economist John Kenneth Galbraith spoke recently in commencement ceremonies at Johns Hopkins University. As reported in the Washington Star for May 30, 1981, Galbraith lashed out at, quote, those who say that we have to accept the risk of nuclear war to protect our democratic system." Unquote. Galbraith said that to do that is to risk destruction of that very system. He pointed out that the highly sophisticated and deeply integrated modern economic system cannot survive the shock of a nuclear exchange. Another example of those now worrying in public is New York Times columnist James Reston. In his column Dateline June 23, 1981, Reston discussed what he called the Administration's misconduct of foreign policy. He pointed out that American government officials seem to be going in all directions at once, yet all in the general direction of confrontation with Russia. And he says, quote, The troubling thing about all this is that nobody really knows what it means." Unquote. He expresses puzzlement over the Administration's public confirmation of intelligence arrangements with Red China which can only serve to provoke Russia. Finally, he concludes, quote, This is becoming a danger to the Administration, and if it keeps on goading the Soviet bear, even a threat to the peace." Unquote. My friends, why have these and so many other voices trusted by the public been so silent until so late in the game? Where were they five and six years ago? 
When my AUDIO LETTER REPORTS were documenting the secret Rockefeller Soviet alliance and its collapse, why did they speak only of détente? The answer in some cases, my friends, is that half a decade ago America's ruling circles were still in bed with the Soviet Union. The Rockefeller cartel thought it controlled Russia through the Bolshevik rulers of Russia. Today everything has changed. The Bolsheviks have been overthrown at the highest levels of power in Russia. Flocking here to the United States for a new start, the Bolsheviks in turn have wrestled power away from the Rockefeller cartel. In the so-called National Election last November 1980, the crumbling Rockefeller oil cartel made a desperate bid to retake control of the United States Government. In AUDIO LETTER No. 59 last October, I reported that the cartel had regrouped under the direction of John J. McCloy. Using the figurehead known as Ronald Reagan, Big Oil tried to oust the Bolsheviks. They wanted to get America back onto the track of their own corporate socialist dictatorship. The McCloy-dominated forces of Big Oil did succeed in their great surprise landslide in the election itself, but the actual transfer of governmental power was another matter. In AUDIO LETTER No. 61 last January, I reported that the obscure Bronte decision of the Supreme Court would stand in the way. Sure enough, to this day large numbers of critical government positions are still unfilled or staffed by Bolshevik holdovers. The McCloy Group are getting their way in some areas, but not in foreign policy. America's foreign policy is still under total Bolshevik control. These are the facts, my friends, behind the unusual expressions of alarm by those normally silent Establishment voices. I have been told confidentially by extremely well-informed sources that the so-called Reagan Administration has jumped the tracks. It's out of their control, and now none other than John J. McCloy himself has been quoted publicly in exactly these same terms. Earlier I quoted from James Reston's New York Times column of June 23. The most significant statement in the entire column was the following, and I quote, John J. McCloy, former head of the World Bank and former United States High Commissioner in Berlin, was down here this week saying what he thought as usual about the conduct of American foreign policy. Mr. McCloy thinks that an administration whose success he favors has gone off the track." Unquote. McCloy and his fellow members of the Rockefeller establishment have no love for the independent-minded Russians who now control the Kremlin, but unlike the Bolsheviks here, they do think it is to our advantage to at least keep talking. Recently a faithful listener of mine who is concerned about the need for arms control wrote an influential American industrialist who is also a former Ambassador to Russia. He wrote back that it would be dangerous and unwise to simply trust the Russians in whatever they say, except, quote, if what is to be trusted is carefully written out and agreed upon mutually, then I think one can trust them to observe the agreement." Unquote. I might mention that this agrees with my own personal experience during my years with the United States Export-Import Bank. The Russians and their Warsaw Pact partners are always hard bargainers. They do not regard you as sincere or to be taken seriously unless you will bargain hard and long, but once an agreement is reached, they always observe it scrupulously. The problem is, to bargain with the Russians you have to know what you want. If you want to genuinely control nuclear arms, you will have to bargain toward that objective and genuine arms control is the last thing that would occur to America's present Bolshevik-dominated government. On June 22, the President's nominee to head the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency practically said as much. In Senate testimony, Eugene V. Rostow said, quote, It may be that a brilliant light will strike our officials, but I don't know anyone who knows what it is yet that we want to negotiate about." Unquote. 
In the same testimony, Rostow also said that the United States would not be ready to start strategic weapons talks with Russia until March 1982. He lumped in not only the SALT talks but also the issue of nuclear missiles in Europe. On June 29, 1981, the entity President Brezhnev said, quote, We are ready to sit down at the negotiating table on that issue even tomorrow, if you like, but talks have not begun yet because of the United States' attitude." Unquote. The Russians have also said that they would halt deployment of their European theater nuclear weapons during the talks if America would do the same. However, this is not a precondition to talks, contrary to some reports in the United States. When Eugene Rostow mentioned that the United States needs nine more months to get ready for arms negotiations, it was a slip of the tongue. Later he had to recant about it to the astonished Senators on the Foreign Relations Committee saying he would not delay SALT negotiations. The nine-month preparation time stated by Rostow has nothing to do with any coming arms control initiatives. After all, Rostow himself said no one even has any arms control ideas to talk about. Instead, Rostow was referring accidentally to the nuclear war preparations now underway. Bolshevik military planners here now expect that by March 1982 essential nuclear first strike preparations will be completed in the United States. At that point, with the weapons already in place, we can pretend to talk. But as we talk, we will also be setting in motion the events which are to lead to Nuclear War I. The nine-month interval mentioned by Eugene Rostow is based primarily on two military programs. One is the Space Shuttle program. The other is America's secret mobile missile program, which is going on under the cover of the bogus MX project. I reported on the basic outlines of both of these programs in the past so I will simply update those reports now. First about the Space Shuttle program. Last month I reported that NASA plans to intentionally abort the upcoming Shuttle launch in September. The Shuttle presently at Cape Canaveral is not the Columbia which was destroyed in the unsuccessful mission last April. I gave the details about that and the television hoax to hide the disaster in AUDIO LETTER No. 64. The shuttle which we will see lifting off from Cape Canaveral this fall will be the Training Shuttle Enterprise, although of course it has been relabeled Columbia. The Enterprise is the same shuttle that we saw landing in California after the real Columbia had already been destroyed. The flight this fall is intended to keep up appearances while the secret military shuttle team figure out how to get past the Russians into orbit. One way or another, they believe that a successful shuttle flight will be able to provide essential reconnaissance over Russia by the spring of 1982. The other major factor is the Minuteman TX Mobile Missile Deployment. I first reported on this secret program just over a year ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 55. In AUDIO LETTER No. 60 last November, I gave an important update concerning the anti-Cosmosphere missiles which are being deployed along with TX missiles. I can now report that these Anti-Cosmosphere Missiles, or ACMs, are becoming an essential key to the Bolshevik war plan. It is by means of the ACMs that the Bolsheviks plan to set off what will seem to be accidental nuclear war. To review for a moment, my friends, the Minuteman TX is a completely secret mobile missile program. For public consumption, the Pentagon is pretending to be concentrating on something called the MX. The MX, we're told, will be big and powerful, each carrying ten nuclear warheads, and to hide it from the Russians, we're told that it will be mobile. Over the years, one basing scheme after another has been talked about for the MX. About six weeks ago, on May 27, Henry Bradshaw of the Washington Star listed some of the MX basing systems that have been proposed, quote, orbital basing, shallow underwater submarine basing, floating missiles in the ocean, attaching them to the ocean bottom, mounting them on inland waterway barges and on ocean-going ships, 
aerial launching from special seaplanes, special land-based planes, new short airfield planes, new vertical takeoff planes, and dirigibles, putting thousands of smaller missiles in fixed silos, moving only the warhead and guidance systems among multiple missile fuel bodies." Unquote. My friends, work is going on to develop a larger ICBM under the MX program, but that work is being used as a decoy and to provide a funding channel for America's real mobile missile, the Minuteman TX. The Pentagon wants to make sure that everyone focuses their attention on the MX decoy program. The best way to get people's attention, you know, is to make them angry, so that's what the Pentagon has done. The Air Force is pretending to fight tooth and nail for a patently ridiculous basing system, the infamous racetracks in Utah and Nevada, and sure enough, people are up in arms over the MX. Farmers, ranchers, environmentalists, anti-nuclear activists, you name it. The MX decoy system is drawing all the fire like the lightning rod it is meant to be. Thanks to the orchestrated MX controversy, our real mobile missile, the Minuteman TX, is being completely overlooked. Unlike the giant MX, the TX is relatively small. It's being deployed in the one way which should be most obvious of all. It is the one way never mentioned in connection with the MX because the Pentagon does not want us to think of it. The Minuteman TX missiles are being deployed on America's railroads. They are moved around constantly, often right under our very noses. In AUDIO LETTER No. 55 I gave a description of the unique railroad cars which house the TX missiles. Months later some of my listeners began sending me photographs of them, and several months ago I released a special bulletin containing these photographs. In AUDIO LETTER No. 60 I described the ACM missiles which are beginning to accompany the TX missiles as they are shuttled around. The ACM is basically like an ABM missile built to take off with blinding speed. Each is armed with a cobalt ionization bomb. When they explode at the upper fringes of the atmosphere, the Bolsheviks here believe they will interfere temporarily with any Russian Cosmospheres hovering overhead. Before the Cosmospheres can recover, the TX missiles will be launched at Russia in a nuclear first strike. In AUDIO LETTER No. 55 I explained that the nerve-wracking false nuclear alerts by NORAD were actually deliberate tests by Bolshevik agents. They want to make sure that they can bring about a supposedly accidental first strike against Russia that cannot be countermanded in Washington. Early this year of 1981, the Bolsheviks here concluded that the best way to do this is to shift the United States onto a launch-on-warning stance. Up until recently, the United States nuclear forces have required a positive order from the President before launching a nuclear attack. In theory, that's still true, but in practice it's being changed quietly. Our strategic forces are being reprogrammed to launch an all-out attack on Russia under either of two conditions. The basic instruction is to await a positive command from Washington, but a super-secret new instruction tells nuclear forces they need not wait for a positive launch order under one extraordinary condition. This extraordinary condition is defined as, quote, widespread loss of C3 connectivity due to EMP, unquote. EMP stands for Electromagnetic Pulse a phenomenon associated with nuclear blasts at the fringes of the atmosphere or near space. In the early 1960s it was discovered by nuclear testing that EMP can overload and disable all kinds of electrical equipment, even power lines. It is known that today EMP would virtually wipe out the command, control, and communication system of the United States called C-3 by the Pentagon. The Bolshevik military planners here are turning this vulnerability to their own advantage. Through their appropriate avenues they are arguing, suppose the Soviet Union preceded an attack on the United States by using EMP to wipe out our communications. They could set off a single H-bomb 
250 miles over Omaha, Nebraska. All of our communications from Maine to California, plus parts of Canada and Mexico, would be fried by EMP. Afterward, the President would have no way to get word to our ICBM crews, bomber crews, or submarines to retaliate. The Russians could hit us, say the Bolsheviks, and we would not hit back. Using this argument as an excuse, Bolshevik military planners here are disseminating new secret orders to our nuclear forces. These orders say that should there be an EMP episode that cuts off communications, that is to be taken as proof in itself, per se, that we are under nuclear attack. Under the new launch on warning posture of our armed forces, they will not wait for any further orders. Obeying the secret new standing orders, all of our ICBMs, bombers, and missile submarines will launch all-out retaliation on Russia. That is, they will believe they are retaliating, but what they will actually be doing is mounting a nuclear first strike against Russia. When the Bolsheviks here are ready for it to happen, they will launch the anti-Cosmosphere missiles which now accompany the mobile Minuteman TX missiles. The ACMs will race to the fringes of space over America and explode their Cobalt ionization bombs. When that happens, it will do more than just interfere with the Cosmospheres. It will also create a violent EMP episode. All communications to centralized authority will be cut off, and our nuclear forces will believe it is due to a Russian attack. There will be no time and no way to double-check, and so United States forces will attack Russia. The Bolsheviks here will have set off Nuclear War I, and they will make it look as if it all happened by accident. Topic No. 3 One year ago this month I began responding to a question I was being asked at that time by many people. The question was, What can I do? I did so reluctantly for the reasons I gave at the time, and yet I also did so hopefully. I felt that if that many people really wanted to take action, there might really be a chance. I explained why, in my opinion, there was only one weapon that could possibly save America from our headlong plunge toward nuclear war. That weapon is the truth. In particular, it is the truth about the covered-up Fort Knox Gold scandal that could stop our internal enemies in their tracks. I started giving suggestions month by month for what you could do. We began with Senator William Proxmire, then Chairman of the Senate Banking Committee. Later on we directed our efforts and attention to the privately owned Federal Reserve System, which holds legal title to America's missing gold. Finally, we gave the entity President Reagan the chance to do his duty to look into the matter. I believe the time has come to give you an honest accounting of where we stand. My friends, we have given every possible opportunity to those who have the appropriate authority and responsibility to investigate honestly. And what have they done? Has a single official of the United States Government, or of the Federal Reserve Corporation, or of Congress taken the people's side? No. Without exception they have all come down on the side of keeping the lid on the facts about our missing gold. Without exception they are saying in effect that they don't care about the destruction of our hard-earned dollars in our economy. They don't care that you cannot make ends meet. They do not care that America's economic collapse is paving the way for dictatorship and war. They care only about keeping themselves on what they believe will be the winning side, and they have proven by their actions that they believe those who stole our gold will be the winning side. Senator William Proxmire aided by the so-called Inspector General of the Treasury Department, steadfastly refused to investigate. The Federal Reserve Corporation has also closed ranks to keep out the light of truth. For a while, a few months ago, certain high officials of the regional Federal Reserve Banks were being surprisingly cooperative. Now all that has been put to a stop. Several officials have resigned. All the rest have gone silent as stone. On June 22, 1981, my friend Mr. Edward Durrell 
sent a certified letter to every single Federal Reserve System Director in the United States. In that letter he warned each Director of his or her individual legal responsibility relative to the nation's missing gold reserves. Based on various legal precedents, each one is legally liable if any of the gold is missing, and yet not a single one has dared to break through the wall of silence which has now been imposed. And then there's the President. The entity known as Ronald Reagan gives beautiful lip service to the idea that any governmental abuses should be rooted out. So three months ago I invited you to send mailgrams to him urging him or his representatives to look into the gold scandal. For starters, we urged him to investigate the discrepancy of 165 million ounces between different statements of the Treasury itself on our gold supplies. My friends, I have never heard one peep out of the White House in reply, and so far as I know, no one who sent a milligram even had it acknowledged. My friends, there can be no more appeals to authority except to the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is above all. Time is running out. By this time next year Nuclear War I could be upon us, so I urge those of you who still want to take action to do it right where you are. Use your files of correspondence to share what you have learned with others if they are interested. Let the power of the truth do its work in spite of the corruption in high places and let your own knowledge of the truth about current events help you decide wisely in taking care of your own family needs. Now it's time for my last minute summary. My friends, time is fast running out for the United States of America. Timetables can never be firm, but the Bolsheviks here are now shooting for around mid-1982 to set off Nuclear War I. Even now a great naval disaster has befallen the United States because of their maneuverings. My friends, a day of judgment is coming soon for America. Americans by the millions are going along with the satanic ideas of the Bolsheviks here. We are filling up a cup of wrath for ourselves, and soon we will drink it. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you and may God bless each and every one of you.